This is a talk by Tony Mount for Westminster Reference Library concerning my new book, The World of Isaac Newton. Hi everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the staff at Westminster Reference Library, especially Susanna, Susie, Nina and Ricardo for arranging this event. The slide you can see shows the site of Westminster Reference Library, which was the site of Isaac Newton's house in St. Martin Street. My new book, The World of Isaac Newton, isn't intended as an academic science treatise, but as a popular work covering a number of disciplines, including biography, political and social history, as well as science and mathematics. Isaac Newton is, obviously, famous for his experiments with light, gravity, and falling apples. But the period of history into which he was born was turbulent, vibrant, and on the cusp of industrialization. These were exciting and frightening times. Newton may have preferred the quiet life of a Cambridge scholar for many years, but the world beyond affected every aspect of his life. In the century before Newton's birth, the world was already moving away from old medieval ideas. The new world of the Americas had been discovered, rewriting the ancient geographies of the Greeks and Romans, which had served well enough for a thousand years. Exploring this expanded globe required new methods of navigation, maps and magnetic compasses, all of which had to be revised and made more accurate and sophisticated. Advances in mathematics introduced new conventions such as the plus minus and equal symbols, simplifying the writing of equations. Newton would reap the benefits and go on to expand the entire field of calculation. When he was born at the outbreak of the English Civil War, childbirth was a dangerous time for both mother and baby in an age before hygiene was considered necessary and female anatomy was little understood no wonder the underweight infant isaac was not expected to survive but against the odds he did newton's childhood was spent under a puritan regime during his time at Grantham Grammar School, he lodged with William Clark, a strict Puritan and a skilled apothecary. Clark's influence affected Newton greatly for the rest of his days. The Puritan regime came to an end, replaced by a pleasure-loving monarchy, but Newton maintained a Puritanical lifestyle and an interest in laboratory experimentation, both inspired by Clark until the end of his life. The school curriculum, which at first bored Newton and then drove him to improve his methods of study, is discussed in the book, along with many aspects of religion, a matter of daily significance in this period. The book sets Newton in the world of his philosophical acquaintances, peers, and in particular his fellows at the Royal Society, a group which became significant in his life. 
He acquired powerful friends and patrons, but through his tendency to take offence and to offend others, he had enemies too who would thwart his efforts if they could. Edmund Halley proved to be a good friend. The Earl of Halifax, a fine patron. Robert Hooke became a lifelong opponent and John Flamsteed's friendship turned to enmity. There were foreign influences as well, not only in scientific circles, but in methods of travel, fashion and food. The Dutch figure significantly in the story as participants in the philosophical world, in wars at sea, as monarchs and even as the originators of that 18th century curse, gin. A new coffee house culture was developing, new foodstuffs became popular. Newton may not have cared for either, but his associates certainly did. That English preoccupation, the weather, affected everyone, and the advent of the Little Ice Age made winter a particularly difficult time. Frost fairs were set up on the frozen river Thames to enliven the gloom of long winters. Health issues were on the agenda for rich and poor alike, from plague to smallpox from over-enthusiastic physicians to experimental self-medication. The royal family suffered from both ill health and the maladministration of medicine as much as any of their subjects. Health problems played a part in the downfall of the Stuart dynasty, bringing the Hanoverian kings to the throne of Great Britain. Just a few, like Samuel Pepys, could celebrate the successes of surgery. During Newton's life at Cambridge, the Trinity College Library was rebuilt to a design by Christopher Wren, making more books available for study. The Lucasian Professorship was set up. Newton's mentor and namesake, Isaac Barrow being the first appointee to the post. In his later years, his work at the Royal Mints became pivotal for Newton, taking him from the quiet life of Cambridge and into the senior side of London, the world of counterfeiters and crooks. His own financial dealings were not always a success as might be expected of a genius with figures and make interesting reading. Meanwhile, his knowledge of alchemy and his organisational skills enabled him to undertake the vast project of reminting all the coins of the realm. And in this, he was successful. His other preoccupation was the study of ancient religions and the origins of Christianity, a topic which could have landed him in deep trouble with the church authorities had they realised his unorthodox beliefs. Secrecy was always Newton's watchword. My book concludes by considering the continuing advances being made and explored in our own time as a result of Newton's scientific work. As I was writing in July 2019, the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing was being celebrated. A timely reminder that without Newtonian mathematics, such adventures would not be possible. Space exploration, microsurgery, and the world of artificial intelligence. All these and far more are derived from Newton's legacy. The wonders of physics and mathematics that he strived to consolidate 
in a coherent, measurable form. How much we owe to one man's thought processes is more than he could ever have imagined. The century before Isaac Newton's birth in 1642 was a dramatic one. In the 1540s, England's Reformation changed the religious life of the community beyond recognition. King Henry VIII had broken the kingdom's allegiance to the Church of Rome, severing the last vestige of Catholic papal authority from his new Protestant Church of England in 1536. Yet the break was just the beginning. The real Reformation required a sway the new ideas to be shared and discussed. Changes made to church liturgy, ceremony and worship. Clerics had difficulty agreeing amongst themselves precisely what changes should be implemented and therefore the new Church of England was never going to be an homogenous entity as the Roman Catholic Church was and remained. This fact had consequences in Newton's early life. However, this opening up of new ideas in religion led to a widening of other horizons, quite literally. No longer shackled to medieval Catholic traditions of learning, studying Aristotle, Ptolemy, Galen and other classical thinkers, the Tudors dared contemplate the possibilities of things existing which were previously unknown to the ancients. The discovery and exploration of the Americas, an empty void on the world map of the Greeks and Romans, had revealed new species of fauna and flora, unimagined landscapes and unique indigenous peoples. It was swiftly becoming apparent that classical texts were inadequate for 16th century scholars. Novel methods of learning were required and came to include the radical innovation of experimentation. Isaac was born on Christmas morning 1642 to Hannah Newton at Walsthorpe Manor in Lincolnshire. Hannah was already a widow when her son was born. She had wed Isaac Newton Sr. the previous April, so her marriage had lasted a matter of months before her husband died at the beginning of October. When Isaac was three, his mother remarried. The Reverend Barnabas Smith was already elderly, and if he'd ever wed before, there were no living children of the Union. The marriage to Hannah was purely a business transaction conducted with servants as go-betweens, and little Isaac was not part of the deal. Hannah went to live at her husband's rectory a mile away, leaving her son at Woolsthorpe to be cared for by his grandmother, Marjorie Aysgoff. We don't know much about young Newton's earliest education, but it's likely his grandmother taught him his alphabet and how to read and write. Marjorie was literate, which her daughter wasn't, and perhaps this made all the difference to the way Isaac's life evolved. He attended dame schools at Stoke Rochford and Skillington. These dame schools, or petty schools, were run by women who charged a fee to teach children how to read and recite the Lord's Prayer, the Creed and the Catechism, which in the 1650s were the basic tenets of the Puritan faith, with emphasis on the Ten Commandments as the foundation 
the godly living. Quite what arrangements were made for Isaac's early schooling, we don't know, but his uncle, William Aisgoff, rector of the nearby parish of Burton Coggles, was a graduate of Trinity College, Cambridge, and may have taken an interest in the boy's lessons. We know he was certainly involved in persuading Hannah that Isaac should study at grammar school and eventually at Cambridge when she was most reluctant to allow it. The closest secondary school to Woolsthorpe Manor was the grammar school in Grantham. By the time Isaac was old enough to attend, his mother was back home, having been widowed a second time bringing with her two half-sisters and a half-brother, Benjamin, for Isaac. But Isaac was used to being an only child and seems to have little in common with his siblings. Besides, his mother wanted him to learn all about farming so he could run the manor, understanding livestock and crop growing, things he had no interest in. Mind you, at the time, he didn't have much interest in being a scholar either. Unsurprisingly, he was disruptive at home, quarrelling with his sisters and avoiding farm work as far as possible. It may have been Grandmother Aisgoff or Uncle William who persuaded Hannah that the boy would benefit from going to grammar school and the household run more smoothly in his absence. On the negative side, the school was only free to boys from Grantham. So, since Isaac was an outsider, Hannah would have to pay for his schooling and she begrudged every penny wasted on educating a boy destined to be a humble farmer. What use were Greek and Latin when knowing how to gauge the price of a sheep was far more important? She managed to save a few pence on the cost of Isaac's accommodation by arranging for him to lodge with the Clark family. Mrs Clark was a friend of Hannah's and like Hannah, Catherine Clark had been married before, bringing to William Clark a ready-made family of Storer children, including young Arthur Storer, who would become a lifelong friend of Isaac. Arthur later emigrated to America, becoming the colony's first acknowledged astronomer. He and Isaac exchanged letters for years, discussing all kinds of topics, but especially comparing notes on comets as they view them from opposite sides of the Atlantic. William Clark also had children from a previous marriage and he and Catherine would add to the brood together so his apothecary shop and house on Grantham High Street must have been noisy, crowded with nine children plus their young lodger. Clark was a strict Puritan and with Cromwell in power in the 1650s he was elected Chief Alderman, that is Mayor of Grantham. Isaac got his first taste of scientific experimenting when Clark allowed him to help out in the apothecary shop and mix remedies. Clark also had interesting books on his shelves and as alderman held the keys to the Francis Trigg Library above the porch of St Wolfram's Church opposite the school. To begin with, Isaac wasn't a star pupil, finding schoolwork dull and tedious, but he did love books and got into that habit of making extensive notes about anything he read that interested him. A habit he kept up even in old age. 
Eventually, Newton did become Grantham's best pupil once he'd applied himself to the school curriculum. When he went up to Trinity at Cambridge, those earlier problems were repeated. The standard university curriculum bored him. He studied hard, but not the subjects required. In 1664, realising his bachelor exam was fast approaching, he crammed and passed, but only just. He was lucky that his examiner, Isaac Barrow, though unimpressed by Newton's performance on the day, already knew the young scholar was brilliant at maths, a subject not included in the examination. Barrow was the Lucasian professor of mathematics and regularly sent any student with a tricky maths problem to Newton who could explain things better than the professor. In the early summer of 1665, the plague reached Cambridge. Colleges were closed on the 8th of August and the students sent home. The university remained closed for over a year. Newton returned to Walsthorpe, taking all his books, notes and paraphernalia with him, determined to continue his studies there. Ever practical, he put up a set of bookshelves in his bedchamber to hold his precious volumes and settled down to work. You have to wonder what Hannah thought of her son, who spent hours, days and weeks at a time in his chamber, forgetting to eat, wash or change his shirt, and doing foolish things like staring at the sun until it almost blinded him, and poking blunt needles into his eye, but nothing whatsoever constructive so far as she could see. Although it was during this time that Newton did much of his groundbreaking work on light and gravity. Servants would find Isaac on a winter morning, sitting in his shirt, writing by the window. They used to tell him dinner was ready half an hour beforehand, and still it would stand two hours on the table before he would come down to eat it. And if he found any paper or book to take his attention, the dinner might stand for hours longer untouched. It was said that the cat grew fat on his discarded meals. His gruel of milk and eggs that were carried upstairs to him hot for supper would often be eaten cold for breakfast. Hannah was probably glad when her peculiar offspring went off to Boothby Pagnall to visit his university patron Humphrey Babington and make use of his library and instruments. Back at Trinity, Newton achieved his master's degree without any problem and soon after Barrow resigned his professorship in favour of his more able student. Newton was now Lucasian Professor of Mathematics. Apart from his lecturing duties, giving a course on arithmetic, working in his laboratory and keeping night vigils with his reflecting telescope, somehow Newton stretched his time to include in-depth study of the Bible and other religious writings. He had always been a Puritan at heart, ever concerned to give God due reverence and respect. In the list of sins he'd compiled in his teens, there were numerous confessions to improper observation of the Lord's Day, such as working after midnight on Saturday, failing to give the sermons in church his full attention, and thinking too much about subjects other than God none of which sins are the least surprising in a man with Newton's tendency to become obsessed with whatever work absorbed him at that moment. 
But then he took his religious subjects to a new level, scrutinising texts of ancient wisdom. This was partly due to his interest in alchemy. Day, we may think of alchemy as a black art. It was then a means of unlocking the secrets of matter, discovering how God's creation was put together and thereby exploring the nature of God himself. The twin quest for immortality and converting lead into gold were both the ultimate achievements of perfection. The alchemist's raison d'etre, the first required the body to have perfect health and perfect mind, the second a perfect understanding of the nature of the earth. Alchemy was not a sinister pursuit, but it had always been regarded with trepidation by those who didn't understand it, which was almost everyone. And kings and governments feared practitioners who might be able to create an invincible army or boundless wealth for their enemies if they succeeded in solving the mysteries of creation. Even in Newton's day, alchemy in its ancient form had to be practised in secret. On the 18th of February 1675, Newton attended his first meeting of the Royal Society, founded in 1660 at Gresham College, Bishopsgate in London. There he made the acquaintance of Robert Boyle and Christopher Wren. What he made of his first encounter with Robert Hooke in person has gone unrecorded. Hooke was a keen supporter of coffee house culture. The first coffee house in the Christian world had opened in London in the 1650s during the Commonwealth period. The idea of a public house which served coffee rather than alcohol soon became popular with the Puritans who abhorred drunkenness, especially in London. Physicians recommended coffee's medicinal virtues as a cure or all and even an aphrodisiac for men only. A coffee house was not only a place to buy refreshment, it was a social event, a male-only meeting place. Another recent innovation was available there too, newspapers for customers to read and share. For those who couldn't read, articles were read aloud and the subject matter discussed at length over the coffee. Members of the Royal Society often extended their normal meetings with informal discussions of the latest experiments at Garraway's Coffee House in Exchange Alley, not far from Gresham College. In January 1684, a few members of the Royal Society met there to continue their discussions. They were Robert Hook, Edmund Halley and Christopher Wren. Both Hook and Wren were deeply involved in the ongoing rebuilding of the city after the Great Fire of London of 1666, with Wren's most famous project, St Paul's Cathedral, still barely begun because of lack of funding and continuing disagreements over the final design. Despite these problems, Wren had time to take coffee with his friends. As Hook, Halley and Wren sipped their bowls of coffee in Garraway's on that icy January day, London was in the unrelenting grip of the Little Ice Age. The River Thames was frozen over, but these three were having heated discussions about planetary motions and the part played by gravity in governing the planet's orbits around the sun. 
Everyone accepted that gravity worked, but how did it affect large bodies such as a planet? Halley suggested that gravity would decrease according to the inverse square of the distance of the planet from the source of the gravitational pull, mainly the sun, but with influence from other planets too. Simply put, the inverse square law states that the intensity of gravity, light, heat and other forms of electromagnetic radiation decrease as the distance from the source increases according to the formula 1 over distance squared. It's easily written but intensely difficult to work out because so many factors had to be considered. Unsurprisingly, Robert Hooke claimed he'd done all the mathematics already, but Wren was doubtful and demanded that the ever boastful Hooke show him his calculations. He even offered one of his most valuable books as a prize. But Hook could not produce his work, and the prize went unclaimed. Edmund Halley, though, would persevere with the work, taking the pivotal step of visiting Isaac Newton in Cambridge, hoping the talented professor could assist with the mathematics required. He found the Lucasian professor in his apartments at Trinity, surrounded by piles of notes and books and experimental apparatus. Halley presented his question, and Newton recognised in him a mathematician of considerable ability, if not quite his equal, naturally, because he willingly discussed the problem with Halley rather than sending him away. Newton said he'd already achieved the proofs Halley required. Unlike Hooke's claim, Newton's was no idle boast, but in amongst the clutter of his rooms, he said he could not find his calculations. It is possible he knew exactly where they were, but being obsessively thorough about such matters, he would have wanted to check his calculations yet again before showing them to anyone capable of identifying a mistake. No matter, he would either find them or do them all again and send them to Halley in London. It took time, but Newton kept his word, and the work he sent would be the basis for perhaps the first truly scientific book with mathematical proofs, and maybe the most famous, the Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. By the 1690s, Newton was tired of repeating his lectures to students too dim to understand or else to empty halls when nobody turned up to hear his incomprehensible explanations. The reclusive professor was in need of a new challenge and new surroundings. Meanwhile, his influential friend Charles Montague had been on the lookout for a suitable post for Newton in London, one worthy of his talents. At the age of 53, almost forgotten in the backwaters of Cambridge, Newton received a letter from Montague in his capacity as Chancellor of the Exchequer, offering him the job of Warden of the Mint at the Tower of London at £600 per annum. Previously, the position of Warden had been a sinecure, a title and paid office with little actual work required. But Montague had in mind a monumental project to recoin the entire currency of Great Britain and Newton's would be the genius behind it. 
Fortunately for the whole kingdom's finances, Newton took his work seriously, and that's with any task he put his mind to, was obsessive about every detail. Unlike his predecessor at the Mint, he earned his salary. On the 20th of April, 1696, Newton left Cambridge for London to take up his new position. Apart from overseeing the day-to-day -day business of minting new coins, it had originally been the warden's task to seek out, apprehend and bring to justice any clippers, counterfeiters and otherwise unlicensed producers of the king's coinage. Until his last days, Newton would proceed to carry out his duties to the letter. Despite now living in London, Newton didn't attend many of the Royal Society's meetings because his dislike of Hook had grown into an irrational loathing and contempt that refused to recognise the Secretary's many talents and genius in certain fields of knowledge. Secondly, Newton claimed, whether true or not, that Wednesday afternoons when the society met were the very time when his presence at the Mint was most necessary, and therefore it was inconvenient to attend at Gresham College. But in 1703, Robert Hooke died, and Newton suddenly became a devoted member of the society, and by November he was its president. Newton was knighted by Queen Anne in April 1705, not for its contributions to science, but for his sterling work at the Royal Mint. No pun intended. Sir Isaac was a genuine social celebrity by the 1710s, dining with royalty, including the future King George II and his wife Caroline, who was particularly interested in Sir Isaac's chronology of the world, as yet unpublished, but he gave her a copy. Sir Isaac continued his work at the Mint and regularly attended meetings of the Royal Society, moved to Thursdays to suit himself, right up until his last days. He died on the 20th of March 1727, aged 84. Like a monarch, his body lay in state at Westminster, and a state funeral followed in the Abbey. Not bad for a farmer's son from the backwoods of Lincolnshire. The science of physics has advanced significantly since Newton wrote his Principia so long ago. Yet his work remains not only relevant today, but was sufficiently advanced to provide all the mathematics required for the NASA moon landings of the late 1960s and 1970s. For man's first tentative steps beyond the earth, Newton's work of more than 300 years ago still sufficed just. The fact that Apollo 11's lunar module Eagle landed little off target was no fault of Newtonian mathematics, but due to the computers of the day being so rudimentary. Today's home PC or laptop is more sophisticated, faster and more capable than those NASA had 50 years ago. And a mobile phone has more computing capacity than the orbiting space module of 1969. What an incredible achievement for an illiterate farmer's son who could hardly have envisaged space exploration beyond the pages of science fiction.
In book three of the Principia, Newton calculates the speed at which a projectile must travel in order to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. In other words, a spacecraft's escape velocity. Newton also provided the calculations necessary to determine the craft's trajectory for a successful moon landing, its safe return to Earth orbit, and the reduction of speed and angle of re-entry into the atmosphere required to avoid burning up before splashdown. Today, Newton's fluxions, or calculus, are taught in schools' maths classes. His laws of motion underpin some of the most basic physics lessons. Newton's laws of motion are, apparently, best experienced by astronauts during a spacewalk or EVA, extravehicular activity. Without weight, friction or air resistance, the least push against the space module of the space station could send them floating into oblivion if they're not tethered. One female astronaut described how she moved a payload from a supply ship to the orbiting space station single-handed. On Earth, the payload weighed 800 kilograms, but in orbit, she simply nudged it into place. Brilliant as he was, Sir Isaac Newton, travelling in his sedan chair, can never have foreseen such marvellous eventualities being derived from the use of his fluxions. Neither can he have had any idea that his analysis of the visible spectrum through his prism would one day be extended to include all the other forms of electromagnetic radiation, from radio waves to gamma waves. His legacy remains the wonders of physics and mathematics that he strived to consolidate into a coherent measurable form. Ultimately, Newton did, in a way, set up a perpetual motion machine in that his successors in the field have never ceased to advance his progress along the path where he took those first steps towards modern science and mathematics. In his world, his contemporaries recognised him as a great philosopher, but today, with the benefit of hindsight, he was so much more than that, the instigator of a whole new world of technology, our world. Yet the incredible things he achieved alone in his study are now everyday things, accepted knowledge taken for granted. The debt we owe to one man's thought processes is more than he or anyone else could ever have imagined more than three centuries ago. Thank you. My contact details Thank you very much.